Good evening, everyone. You can take your seats. Hello, my name is Kate Tawney and I'm CEO of State Library uh, Victoria. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all, including audiences at the State Library of Western Australia and other audiences around Australia who are joining us through our live stream. Welcome to the new success presented by the Australian Learning Lecture and the State Library Victoria. This forum is held on the traditional lands of the people of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome tonight's speakers who are innovators and leaders in education and business, Ellen Koshlin, Jennifer Westercott and Charles Bedell. And I'd also like to welcome Jill Callister, Secretary of the Victorian Department of Education and Training and other invited guests. At State Library Victoria, we're committed to bringing big ideas in education to national attention and our partnership with the Koshlin Innovation Fund, the Australian Learning Lecture, is designed to strengthen the importance of learning in Australia for all Australians. And for 161 years, our wonderful library has encouraged lifelong learning. And as many of you know, our spaces and our programs have inspired so many Victorians and visitors in the pursuit of knowledge. So we're very, very proud to be partnering with all to deliver tonight's event. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce the truly extraordinary Ellen Koshlin. She's founder of the Australian Learning Lecture and Ellen's passion, commitment and determination to improve education and learning in this country and beyond is absolutely contagious. And I have no doubt that future generations will greatly benefit from the work that she is leading uh, today. In partnership with the State Library of Victoria, Ellen established the Australian Learning Lecture in 2014, and this is the second in the series. The first was delivered by Sir Michael Barber and hosted by Dame Quentin Bryce in 2015. A quick reminder before we get started, please check that your phones are turned off. As mentioned, we will be streaming tonight's event and we'll also make the recording available online. So please make sure that uh, you send it to those who might be interested who are unable to attend tonight's event. Now, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Ellen Koshlin. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, I love working with Kate because the State Library of Victoria is such an extraordinary exemplar of learning in its most dynamic form. Its programs that span all ages, barely a seat available on its site because people of all backgrounds are pursuing their individual interests in a collective setting. I would also like to thank a few other partners who've made this night possible, and that includes our presenting partners of Bastow Institute of Educational Leadership and the Center for Curriculum Design, and also our event partner, The Monthly. I would like to just spend a few minutes telling you about why we brought Charles Fidel and Jennifer Westacott to this occasion tonight to speak to you. At the heart of all's 10-year ambition is the belief that Alvin Toffler was absolutely accurate in his prediction that in the 21st century it is essential to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And it strikes me that we cannot believe how prophetic that is. Since the last time I stood here two years ago when we gathered for the first lecture, there were things that we couldn't have possibly imagined now on our landscape, fake or authentic news, new alignments of nations, areas of technology where I learned last night we may be storing Amazon products in the sky, and maybe also, most importantly, new biases that we have to confront and new oversights we have to look at. So it seems to me that the capacity to learn, unlearn, and relearn is an essential resource for us to meet those challenges and to sustain a caring and growing community. Yet in Australia, our public discussion tends to focus 
only on funding issues, test scores, school sectors, and disparities between federal and state governments. Rarely is there a discussion of the core purposes of learning and education and what we as a country want to achieve and value. Without attention to ideas, things may go out of date and they may be counterproductive because there are always ideas operating, informing the way we judge ourselves, the way we act, the way we construct our institutions and systems. And one of the ideas that we believe needs reconsideration is the idea of success. And that brings us, obviously, to tonight. All would like to make a proposition to you that it, to serve the interests of our children, we need a new understanding of success. Success at school has always been a highly charged issue. It prompts great aspiration, great effort, but it also causes huge angst and even damage. Many, many young people leave our schools feeling they are a failure or inadequate. This in itself might, might, us, might make us pause, but there is another major factor. That is that our children are entering a future entirely different from the one we have known. When they graduate, it is likely that people will have 17 jobs in one lifetime. Robots will not only drive cars, but do a great deal of legal and accounting work. It will not suffice to have a great basis in English and maths, critical as they will remain. But they will need additional skills, including problem solving, flexibility, capacity to work collaboratively, intercultural understanding, and great strengths within themselves. As a nation, we need to be clear about the idea of success that we are using because it is different from the one in the past. A number of schools, and many of you, I'm sure, are working on the skills that will um, lead to the new success. But this needs to become mainstream and be in the very fabric of what we do at the center and not tinkering around the edges. And that is why it is a great honor to have Charles Fidel here with us tonight to deliver the Australian Learning Lecture 2017. It was Charles in his groundbreaking book, 21st Century Skills, who actually pioneered our understanding of these skills and made a map through his four-dimensional education in a rigorous and very clear way of what is needed. Since that time, he has worked with more than 30 countries and also works with the OECD. Equally, it is a great honor and a delight to have Jennifer Westacott, CEO of the Business Council of Australia, joining us tonight. Jennifer is also leading real change in the business community. The Business Council of Australia has recently published a new description of work readiness, moving from skills to skills, values, and behaviors. A very clear sign that there is a new criteria for success in our contemporary world and moving into the future. We hope that your understanding of the new success that will emerge from these two speakers can contribute to the sense of a shared purpose that we can go forward for this needed change. We also hope you enjoy it and are provoked by it. I am delighted now to ask Jennifer Westacott to come to the podium. Jennifer has been Chief Executive Officer of the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia since 2011, bringing extensive policy experience both in the public sector and in the private sector. 
She has always had a very strong commitment to education and at this very moment is excited about a very major program that the Business Council is doing with the Smith family involving um, cadets, which is taking off among many businesses. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Westacott. Well, thank you very much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional and owners of the land that we meet on tonight, the people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I'd also like to thank the Australian Learning Lecture for inviting me to introduce the second biennial lecture series on the new success, and our speaker this evening, Charles Fidel. My role tonight is to set the context for this lecture, and I'll focus on three points. Making sure we start this discussion in the right place. Secondly, the challenges we are facing and the changing nature of work. And finally, getting our education system right. In setting the context, I think it's very important that we start with the most important issue. Whenever we talk about education, we always start with where we are, what's wrong with the system, Who's not getting what funding? And that's a very, very backward way of looking at things. We need to start these conversations with where we need to be. And I think it's very clear that when we take a good, hard look at the world around us, we are in a very, very different world. Our economy and our society are facing significant disruption. We are seeing report after report after report saying that somewhere between 20 and 60% of jobs will be replaced by new technology, including robotics and artificial intelligence. This will mean that knowledge workers are likely to be both key areas of disruption and key areas of growth. Some traditional industries are in decline and traditional business models are being disrupted, they're transforming or they're disappearing. Our businesses and workers are having to compete on a global stage. Jobs that people trained for 20 years ago have been replaced, offshored, or completely changed. A global marketplace also means greater opportunities for specialisation. Final products will no longer be made in one country. Production will be interest increasingly based on skills, not just cheap labour. And this means skills and capabilities will become tradable commodities in themselves. These bring opportunities as well as threats to Australia. The nature of the employment relationship is very dramatically changing. People are quickly signing up to new business models like Uber, where they can be masters of their own destinies. And it's not just the world of work that's changing. How we communicate is fundamentally different. We have world leaders communicating via apps and on smartphones, one of them on Twitter, uh, and our kids have an intuitive understanding of technology. We are in a very different world. And this new world is very scary for a lot of people. They worry about their future and their children's future. But we need to stop and remember that big disruptions in our society have ultimately been positive. They have meant progress, and progress is an innately good thing. Big disruptions like the Industrial Revolution and automation, in my view, made the world a better place. They meant the end to dangerous jobs, ones that were physically taxing and often monotonous. They also began the end of child labour in a lot of the Western world, something that we still need to do a lot of work on. And the destruction of jobs isn't new. It's existed throughout the 20th century. Jobs have come and gone and will continue to do so in this current phase of disruption. The key difference between our historical disruptions is our mass education system, which if properly organised can smooth the bumps of transition, which is why it is imperative we get education right. But what does it mean to get it right? What does success look like? Charles is an advocate of a complete rethink of our education system, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what he's got to say tonight. And while a complete rethink is challenging. We need to be up for what people like Charles are telling us. Because we often see a fundamental rethink is just too hard and it becomes a very convenient excuse for inaction 
and inertia. But a fundamental rethink does not mean it all needs to be done at once. We can take incremental and careful steps. Take, for example, if you think of our economy, the reform of our tariffs, of our competition, of our financial markets, these were big changes and they were staged in over a long period of time. We've spent far too much time tinkering at the margins with no clear purpose and no clear end goal and no clear sense of what modern success looks like. In tinkering, in thinking of education, we must return to the basic question of what are we preparing young people for? At the moment, our system through mechanisms such as the ATAR drives everyone to focus on preparing young people for their next qualification, when what we really should be preparing them for is life, to realise their potential, to have a life of purpose and fulfilment, what skills they need, not what test they have completed. We should be preparing our children to be decent people and good citizens. We should be preparing them to be thinkers and doers, to have an understanding of history and culture and our place in the world. And we should ignite a passion for learning. And our institutional settings at present are not the best place always to do that. Let me give you one brief example. My partner and I run a small language support centre, primarily for refugees and very disadvantaged people. One of our students is a young boy in year 11 who has extremely poor English through no fault of his own. I was struck then recently when he was given a grade of zero for an assignment he submitted on an extremely complex topic. Three times a week he comes to our centre in his own time to get extra support. He tried really, really hard on this project. He submitted something on time, he worked at it and he was given zero. Whatever happened to five for effort? What do you think that experience has taught him? What kind of love of learning has he got now? So often our schools are a process of ritual humiliation for the different and the disadvantaged, and we cannot allow that to continue. We need to break down structural barriers to create change and be open to radical and new ideas. Let's consider briefly three examples. First, a classic classroom academic model will not be the best approach for everyone. Let's unleash ourselves from the institutional constructs for those it does not work for. Second, while education is the great leveller, homework, a foundation of our schooling system, is often the great divider. It is often a test of do you have someone at home to help you. And many kids today, as I experienced in my childhood, either had parents who were working or did not have the capability to help. Third, the ATAR is about making it easier for universities to pick students, not focused on giving students a learning experience that allows them to reach their full potential and prepares them for life. So I've picked a few of the sacred cows here, but that's why I've called them out. There should be no taboo topics. Everything should be on the table and we should challenge the core ideas that we hold dear. And note the new ideas. And so therefore I'd like to introduce Charles Fidel to tell us about the new success and challenge us to think afresh. Charles is a global thought leader in education. He's best known, as has been said, for, for pioneering the idea of 21st century skills, a topic that we in the business community now talk about all the time when we consider the types of skills we need for young people. Charles is the founder of the Centre for Curriculum Redesign. He's a visiting practitioner at Harvard's Graduate School of Education and chairs the Education Committee advising the OECD. It is our honour to have him here tonight. Can you please join me in welcoming Charles Fidel? Good evening, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so nice to be here. I'm very grateful you're here. And by the way, this is not only about the kids, our children, the students. It's about ourselves, believe it or not. The next 10 to 20 years, uh, we're going to be experiencing changes definitely at a much faster rate than the past 10 to 20. 
And if you thought that the past 10 to 20 were already dizzying, well, attach your seatbelt. So for the Twitterati among us, this is how you can make the world know what uh, you're witnessing here, hashtag for the EDU. And before we fully get going, I would like to express my deep gratitude to the all team for their wonderful competency in preparation and care, and Ellen in particular, my dear friend, thank you so much for making this happen. Really, I'm grateful. But let's not be all serious serious. Let's start with a bit of music. Who's the composer? Yes, Bach. Okay, good. We have we have Conoscenti. How about this one? Beethoven. Wow, you guys are fast. Okay. Well then. Who painted this? Rembrandt. Okay. Another question. Take a look at this art, and just give me your opinion. Here's how we're gonna do this. Um, if you feel this is better than average, you'll raise your hand, and if you feel this is worse than average, you'll raise your hand when I ask you. Uh, I'm not giving you the cop out of average, so you have to be on one side or the other. <laughs> so those who think this is worse than average, raise your hand, visibly. A distinct minority. So. That means all the others think this is better than average. Raise your hand to confirm. I'm trying to make sure there's no one who's trying to be average here. Okay, yes. Well, why do you think I'm asking these questions? Turns out that the music you've heard, the art you've seen, whether it was Rembrandt or this creation, were all algorithmically generated. In other words, mathematical formulas have generated music that sounds like Bach and Beethoven, or paintings that most of you have found pleasant, or paintings that mimic great masters. We are already in a situation where even this uh, very human endeavor of creativity can be encroached upon by technology. We're already at this stage. Furthermore, take a look at this. This is the propeller blade. You see how it's progressed from two blades to three blades to four blades to double four blades. There's an object that most of us in this room use on a almost daily basis, let's say. What do you think that is? Two blades, three blades, four blades? The razor, thank you. The razor blades. Well, it turns out that even inventions follow patterns. And therefore, if you have in your database thousands of patents, you can literally figure out what will be patentable next. So if you were competing with Gillette and you had this database, the moment they introduced the two-blade razor, you're already patenting three and four and so on. So again, even invention is automatable to a certain extent. Already, now. So this has huge implications, and we're gonna get into this quite a bit tonight. But first, congratulations, Australia. You are the happiest. <laughs> you perhaps didn't even realize it yourselves. <laughs> but you are at the top of the heap. According to the OECD, the Better Life Index, you are absolutely number one. Celebrate. 
And so how are we going to proceed so that this remains the case facing a number of challenges? Right, you all recognize these challenges. You've uh, endured some of them and you're living with a lot of them. And technology is going to be adding to all this. Technology is really the oil on the fire. Technology is an accelerant. It's an accelerant of good things and bad things. Technology is amoral. It can be used to do amazing things and rather poor things as well. So here we are having amazing technology at our disposal. And with that will come the two sides of it. One thing I think we're all finally figuring out is that we are at the mercy of the weakest link. As a humanity, we sometimes forget that we're all interconnected, and more so than ever. So it is not possible to ignore an, epidem an epidemic happening somewhere around the globe. Within 24 hours, it's on our shores. So it's simply not even a question of altruism. Even in terms of self-protection, we have to pay attention to the weakest links in our system and help the weakest links. So Ebola, for instance, we dodged a bullet worldwide. It could have propagated. When a nurse took a plane in Texas with a fever, was allowed to leave the hospital and take a plane, we all dodged a bullet, a pandemic bullet. And uh, there was one problem we're not dodging, and you're recognizing it. And uh, fires as well that you have experienced in this country. So this is not something we're dodging at all, and we'd better pay, be paying attention. So we have a new world we're all facing. It's a new world that is qualified by futurists. They use this acronym VUCA. VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And I think we all recognize that this is the world we're in now. More than ever, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, which poses the question, what do we need to be successful in that world? Fair enough. So what do you think? What do, you, what do we need, what do our children need to be successful in a world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous? What do you think? I'm sorry? Resilience. Resilience. Thank you. Beautiful. Adaptability, Adaptability. yes. Empathy. Empathy. Critical thinking, thank you. I'm sorry? Creativity, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry? Community, thank you. Problem solving. Global perspective. Hope, thank you. Risk taking. Curiosity. Optimism. Money. <laughs> well, I noticed that none of you talked about, I don't know, more trigonometry. <laughs> you all talked about character qualities, you talked about skills. You already realize from your activities on a daily basis that what you know is not sufficient. It's also how you use what you know, your skills, how you behave and engage in the world, your character, and how you keep on learning how to learn, how to reflect and adapt. And you've known this throughout your lives, throughout your careers, and that's what it's about. So you already knew the answers, we're done. Thank you very much, good night. <laughs> but this is the, this, the, the point here. Not changing is actually more dangerous because we are facing social unrest. We're starting to see it here and there with, let's call it, strange voting patterns. And you know what I'm referring to. And so this is what happens when the pressure builds and people's voices are not heard. Not that those that uh, were put in power necessarily had the right answers, but the questions were fair. So what are we to become in a world where we lose our jobs and are not helped 
to retrain fast enough? Fair questions. Which means that we have to anticipate. Anticipate, move forward ahead of the problem. And that's why not changing is actually more dangerous. We have this inner propensity as humans to resist change. Change is uncomfortable for all of us, I suspect. But not changing is actually more dangerous. And that's what I'm going to try to show you throughout this presentation. In the meantime, we've all been this little kid saying, why do I need to know this? Right? Actually, show of hands, who has been thinking when they were in school, tell me again, why do I need to know this? Well then, thank you for your candor. We've all been that kid and always begged for relevance because that's why we pay attention to something. Tell me that it's relevant for my life. And students and employers alike realize a lot better than educators that there's uh, something amiss here, right? By a factor of two, educators think, uh, let's say, more highly of themselves than, than their customers. We know where good jobs are. Uh, FYA has done, here in Australia, has done an excellent analysis of what are the occupations that are resistant to the encroachment of technology. And they fall into these three categories. The technologists, and you would have guessed that, of course. The caregivers, people who have to have contact with others, and you also would have thought of that. But there are also the third category, the informers, people who connect people to others, but they're also massaging information. So you see here lists of occupations that are reasonably safe. What we also fail to do, though, is to predict the new jobs. We always focus on the ones that disappear. We always forget about the ones that get created. This was compiled by the World Economic Forum, 10 jobs that didn't exist a decade ago. And you recognize a lot of them, you know, drone pilots. No one would have told me 10 years ago we'd have drone pilots. Note, however, that a number of them have a very high skill set. Big data analysts, cloud computing, they're all technology. Many of them at the high end of the pay scale are technology jobs. So let's look at the impact of technology in depth. Let me take you through a sweep of a number of technologies that are affecting us and doing so increasingly. Technology is moving at an exponential rate, which means the processing power is doubling every two years. And that's how we've gone through my career in technology from car phones to supercomputers in our pocket connected to unfathomable supercomputing, I mean computing power in the cloud with mass storage. That in 25 years. That's what happens due to exponentials. And we have a number of technologies coming our way, such as, for example, augmented reality, where we'll be able to superimpose over reality a virtual object. Right now, at first, it will be done through external glasses, but the University of Washington is developing contact lenses so that we'll all just be wearing contact lenses and walking together in Lugano and selecting the best restaurant because we see everything on our retina. We'll see the ratings. We'll see even recognize, we'll be even, even to recognize people as we walk by them and we'll see their profiles. We'll need to block things. We'll need to protect ourselves. It's going to be really interesting. Let me show you what happens, just for fun. So once you have these contact lenses,
Well done. Level complete. Sight System presents Sightseeing. Feel free to go anywhere. Reminder. Date at 9 p.m. Choose outfit. There was nothing on the walls, of course, because you can have the greatest art on your contact lenses. You can just have anything virtually, right? You don't have to have physical objects anymore. Patrick. Patrick. Oh. Hi. Hi, Daphne. How are you? Sorry. It's okay. You look great. Thank you. Love your jacket. Thanks. Uh, it's actually it's a, it's a sports jacket, so it's a lot less official than it looks. What do you mean? Sorry? What's the difference? between a sports jacket and a normal one? Uh, I guess a sports jacket is for people who want to look good even when they're chased by the police. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're hungry. This yeah. place has the best burgers in town. Oh, actually I'm a vegetarian. Oh. Yeah. Really? Because you didn't say it on your profile, so... Well, I don't write everything on my profile. Um, do you want to go somewhere else? No, 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 it's okay. So you get the message. Actually, with the exception of the contact lenses, nothing here is, I mean, actually, even including the contact lenses, nothing is science fiction. This is all technology, these are all technologies that already exist in various bits and pieces. They haven't been assembled this way yet, but they all exist. There are plenty of systems out there that can ascertain your stress levels via microwave energy or heat body, uh, body temperature maps. And if I had the system, I could tell you what most of you are thinking. Are you bored? Are you excited? Falling asleep? See, the systems that he has um, is in essence putting all putting together all these physiological signs. The system is detecting her pupil dilation, her temperature, uh, her skin humidity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And because the system is also mining her profile, Wingman is giving him suggestions. Basically, he's incapable of detecting her stress, but the system is, and the system is trying to help him gain some emotional capabilities here. So, you know, that the fact that she's anxious, impatient, and unimpressed has to be pointed out <laughs> so he can do something about it. So, of course, that is uh, augmented reality. There are other possibilities that are completely virtual, meaning you have your goggles on and you go deep. And now you can go deep into different worlds. Look around. The world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. More immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap in the place of the old one. Now what? And tighten here and here. So just as you were thinking, well, if I'm a plumber, my job is safe. It cannot be exported. Think again. This person guiding you can be on the other side of the world. And this is just, of course, you know, again, a different type of augmented reality. The, the, full, the full immersion allows you to be an avatar and so on. I mean, you've seen systems like this. I'm not going to 
repeat this sort of thing, but uh, it's just to show you the uh, capabilities we're going to be facing. And we're all going to be bemoaning the lack of personal contacts, right? This is not new. This is dating back to the early 19, actually 1906 to be precise, where uh, radio was feared to pull people apart. To a certain extent, it has. To a certain extent, it has brought people even closer. But it is clear that a plethora of screens has its effects that we have to be mindful of. Now let's talk about artificial intelligence in particular. You know, it's being applied everywhere. All of a sudden, the investment has absolutely exploded, and we have all the giants of technology and a ton of startups all investing in all sorts of areas of artificial intelligence where it can have impact, like uh, video recognition and text-to-speech and so on and so forth. In just five years, take a look at this cartoon. Okay, that was in 2011. And at the time, it was a cartoon, a joke. The reality is, now you can get Amy, your automated assistant. Done. Five years. And of course, would we need a foreign would we need to learn a foreign language from here on, right? So I'm going to do this without a net. Bear with me. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, network error. Thank you. <laughs> That's what happens. I'm very happy to be here. Anyone speaks Chinese here? And? Thank you. <laughs> and I can do this in 95 different languages from one to the other. Now, mind you, the answer is still we need to learn foreign languages, but not just to, you know, vaguely ask for the keys of a room or something like that. We're really having to go for fluency. These systems are not going to be able to give us fluency for quite some time, they'll be able to help us with conversational capabilities. These systems are not going to give us an idea of the culture that we're dealing with, and so be careful about how you say things, right? So the cultural aspects need to be understood, and for more than just one language, for that matter, and of course the cognitive benefits of learning a language. So the answer is still yes, but it changes the mix and the purpose of learning a foreign language. This is just one example across many of how technology is going to be impacting us. And then, of course, robots or artificial intelligences learn from each other. That's the amazing part. Just think for a second. If all of us could have instant access to everyone's experiences, good and bad, and everyone's wisdom, just think about how much more progress we'd make instantly in this room, instantly. And yet, when a robot's going to drop some patient somewhere around the world, all the other robots of the same kind will learn not to do the same. So imagine if we had that affordance. And not just for people in this room, but people in this country, on this planet, all the people who lived before us would be different, a very, very different species. And so the progress becomes hyperbolic, not just exponential. And yes, robots will be displacing workers serving hamburgers. So for that dream job that you had in mind, <laughs> I'm sorry, but you may have to revise your, your hopes. Yeah, they can be very cost-effective, and believe me, they will never to forget to ask you whether you want fries or not. Never. And yes, the cartoonists are having a field day. But this is not something that's new again. 
We've always feared this moment. And now let's talk about even more technologies, right? 3D printing. You've all seen 3D printing with cute blue bunnies in resin and so on. Yeah. But now there are titanium parts that are flying on aircraft. Yeah. So you can use 3D printing to micro-machine parts at a much lower cost. You can even design and build organs. I mean, for aesthetics, as in this case, but soon, kidneys and livers. Another type of technology. How many of you have a Fitbit or equivalent? Quite a few people. And with our smartphones, we'll be able to track even more parameters and quantify just about everything about us. Of course, my, uh, my scenario for Black Mirror, if you know that uh, British series, is that someone's gonna hack it and give you a false reading for your heart rate and you think you're gonna be in the safe zone and actually you're gonna collapse <laughs> because you'll be at 220 and this will be saying oh, 140. <laughs> By the way, this is exactly what happened to the centrifuges in Iran, remember? They made, made them think that they were rotating slower than they actually did and they dismantled, smash. Okay, so you heard it here first. Then there's the Internet of Things, where your fridge is connected to your Fitbit or equivalent and decides not to open because you've had too many calories today. <laughs> it will happen inevitably. And then there will be the temptation to keep up with everything, right? So why do we consider that caffeine is the only uh, socially acceptable stimulant? Why not Ritalin or Adderall or whatever? And why not use transcranial magnetic stimulation? It has been proven already to work with depression. Why not? And then, of course, there's the whole biotech side of things, right? Genome sequencing. It cost one and a half billion dollars for the first genome. Now you can get your genome for a thousand dollars. And in another decade, 10 cents. So at 10 cents, you'll be sequencing yourself, everybody in your family, your friends, your vague acquaintances, your pets, your favorite bacteria, anything you want. <laughs> and then there's genome editing. Sequencing is one part of it. Editing is where it's at. With CRISPR, you can edit genes for $10,000 in a garage. Will we resist? Absolutely not. Of course not. At first, we'll be wanting to edit out congenital diseases, for instance, which we do screen for, by the way. It's already a form of editing. But over time, the pressure will be there to enhance ourselves, and we'll have to figure out to do it in a way that's equitable and ethical. That's going to challenge us as a humanity. Not like the rest is not going to. Then there's stem cells. Right here in this picture, you see a few nerve cells, I mean, a few brain cells, actually, that were grown. But we can do even more than that. We can grow burgers and grow meat, right? Protein in your kitchen. Without the methane production, the water usage, etc. would this be considered vegan? I think so. <laughs> right? Vegan meat, a new concept. And then there's synthetic biology, where we create life from spare parts that we assemble. This was a first last year. So all of these things are coming together. They're accelerating each other. So when I told you at the beginning of this presentation that the next 10 to 20 years were going to be a lot more fast-paced than the past 10 to 20 years, I don't think I was joking. See you in 10 years, and you'll tell me whether I was right or wrong. And we're very, very limited by our imagination. We have a hard time fathoming how these things work, right? This was in 1899. Someone, in, a cartoonist in France, was asked to describe what the year 2000 would be like, created a bunch of cartoons. This is how he viewed robots. 
of course you had to have a maid, so the maid was there and pulling a mechanical contraption, and I'll remind you that in 1899, mechanics were the high tech of the times. So it was very techy, but not in a million years could they have imagined Roomba, right? Completely different form factor, just unimaginable. And yet, that's what we're facing, trying to figure out all these things. So here's what's really happening in the end. It's this race between technology and education that's taking place. It's what happened with the Industrial Revolution. Technology zoomed ahead. And now with the digital revolution, we have the same situation occurring. Technology is zooming ahead of where education has been. And the disturbing part is that when technology is ahead, we find ourselves in situations of social pain. When te technology has, when education catches up with technology, we have prosperity. And so it's up to us, all of us, to get involved to make sure that we minimize the social pain and maximize our prosperity. So, what's holding us back? A number of things. University entrance requirements that reflect the past in a very narrow view of what measures our capabilities going to university. What's holding us back are assessments that are, again, very narrow, grade-centric about very traditional things, not measuring the entire individual and its capabilities. I'm not saying that assessments don't matter. I'm saying they have to be done the right way for the right parameters. And then politics. You know, that's, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the strength and the bane of democracies. No broom, everything goes. We're starting all over. You know, no one says, well, what you've done was correct, and I'm going to build on it. No, no, everything just goes out the window. We start all over again. And then there's bias. All of us have bias. That's normal. That's part of being human. But experts that are asked to think about new standards of education always consider that what they know is more important than anything else, so they're focused on the bark of the tree. They're not looking at the richness of even their own discipline. They're defending, let's say, geometry, or even worse, trigonometry, <laughs> as if we needed as many woodworkers and land surveyors as we did 100 years ago when that was introduced. Now, we still need to understand periodicity, mind you, but we certainly need to understand data, so statistics and probabilities and so on, and how mathematics interfaces with the rest of the ecosystem, the whole forest, how do we use mathematics? And I'm not picking on mathematics only. Every single discipline has the same bias, being very, very narrow. So, in the end, it's a question of fear, right? We fear change, and we're paralyzing ourselves, and we're living with this caterpillar without realizing that it has in it the same DNA that makes it fly. And we're just paralyzing ourselves with fear, and we have to transcend it. So, what's happening, of course, is that we're all getting frustrated. The students are saying, hey, what gives? I know this is not preparing me well. We have parents. Parents that say, yeah, I'm kind of confused. I'm not recognizing the world. I'm not recognizing some of my, what my, my child is learning. Is that the right way? Um, these projects, that sounds a bit goofy to me. You know, why not just drill like I was drilled? Hmm. And then the teachers, they're not trained to new methods, and the requirements that are imposed on them come from the top, and they're not allowed to change them. And so we sometimes bark at the wrong tree by blaming the teachers for their inability to change. And the policymakers and the administrators have been burned. They tried a few things timidly, and they've been burnt, and they've recoiled. So. Let's look at what this is really about. How can we actually thrive and prosper? We have this opportunity. Let's seize it. We're really talking about fulfilling individuals. 
everyone's dreams fulfilled, everyone's capabilities used to the maximum extent possible with societies that are sustainable and joyful. And that implies that we would find a passion for every one of our children, every one of us, and play to our passions. It doesn't mean that we, have, we only learn what we're passionate about. It means that we can also focus, identify, and focus on our passions. It's, it's an end conversation. So often we hear this or conversation. It's this or that. Why are we so narrow? Why are we so narrow? Why can't we see that the world is always better when we have an end conversation? And this is really a mindset shift. So we train the head, the hand, and the heart, not one or the other. We're really trying to build ourselves and our children for the whole world, our whole self for the whole world. Basically, not surprisingly, it's the Maslow Pyramid. All the needs we have from bottom to top. And no, we're not going to wait decades until we reach the top. All these needs have to be met we all, you know, all at the same time. It's not a progression. And that's why even employability is changing. It used to be that through employability, you try to hit those bottom four layers. But ask any millennial, and I think we have quite a few among us here, do you really wait, need to want to wait 40 years of your life until you get to the higher layers, or do you want them now? You're, yeah, you know what I mean. Millennials, you want it now, and you're absolutely right. So it's a question of versatility. In the end, we're talking about the 21st century that's moving constantly and forcing us to think through, you know, what is the toolkit we can assemble very early on and continue building on through our life so that whatever life throws our way, we know how to react and we are equipped to react. Swiss Army knife comes to mind as an analogy. Whatever happens, whatever tool we need, we have it. Except that we have a couple of problems to fix. Minor ones, mind you. Only two things, what we teach and how we teach it. Sounds simple. So let's start with the what. First of all, let's really clean up. You know, let's go through everything we have on the docket and see what's relevant for today's time. I'll give you the, the example of trigonometry as a quip. In reality, every single discipline is full of old things that don't matter. They're there just because they've been there since the Greeks or whatever. We really have to go back and clean seriously to figure out what matters in this age so we can make room for the areas of these disciplines that matter a lot more today and for tomorrow. And also that we free up time and space to bring in new disciplines, the ones that should be part of the curriculum, like personal finance or robotics or wellness or entrepreneurship, things that actually matter more than ever. So why wouldn't we do that? Well, we can't if the time is sucked up by all these old things. And then embed in that themes that are relevant to the world today. Uh, one of you mentioned uh, understanding other cultures. Well, that's global literacy. How about fake news, right? Distinguishing between good and bad information. That seems to me like an essential skill and on and on, obviously digital literacy, et cetera. How about learning skills to use that knowledge so that the knowledge doesn't remain inert? So the four C's of creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration, which is what we all do in our daily lives, right? We use this constantly. And our character, right? how we behave and engage in the world. These are the six essential qualities from which you can recompose the 200 words or so that people throw around when it comes to this topic. Right? How we behave and engage in the world. That's as we have aged, we've realized it's not just what I know, it's not just how I use what I know, it's how I act, how I am. 
And lastly, something that's truly at a premium, this ability to continue learning with a can-do attitude, a growth mindset, as it's called, and this metacognitive ability, this ability to reflect and adapt constantly, watch ourselves in action. The trick here is also to make it deliberate and comprehensive and systematic and demonstrable. Very often we have school systems or really good teachers that do some of these things, but they do it sometimes for some kids in some instances. Our ask, our need, is to make this systematic and demonstrable throughout the system. So, here comes the hard question. What do we remove? Mind you, it's perfectly possible to remove things that are extraneous. If we use a scalpel, not a chainsaw, just remove the right bits, the ones that no longer matter as much, or never matter, perhaps, without destroying the whole edifice. This is a careful, balanced conversation. It doesn't get headlines. Right? It's so easy to get lots of clicks if you say, oh, let's do away with algebra, or let's do away with history, let's whatever. Yeah, that gets you clicks, because outrage nowadays gets clicks. A balanced conversation doesn't. If you say, well, we're going to remove this block and that block, it's too nuanced to get press. And yet, this is the hard part, this is what we really need to do, not the sensational stuff. The long slog, the complicated, the smart, things to do. So I apologize that I don't have that much time tonight to go through all the reasoning and all the details of all of this. I think I've thrown a lot at you already. So for those of you who care, you can always download the book. It's uh, available online. And here's the URL. I'm giving you a few seconds to, of course, memorize it. <laughs> and the wiser ones are taking a picture. By the way, it's also in the flyer that uh, has been distributed, it's online, and so on. You can find it, not a problem. OK. So let's talk about the how and conclude soon. We've known for centuries that it's a question of awakening a passion of students. We've known for centuries that we learn best when we do. It's not sufficient to only hear or even see. We have to do to truly understand. And everything I talked about, you would have internalized a lot better if we had done an activity together about it. So it means that as we redesign the how of education, not just the what, which is the first cornerstone, the second cornerstone is to rethink the how. And that means personalizing the learning. That is the holy grail. We've invented mass schooling with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, now we have to invent mass personalization, which doesn't mean that there's not a common trunk that's needed for everyone so that we can have language that we all share in our conversations, be they political or healthcare or otherwise. But there's also how you learn that will be tailored to you a lot better. And that also means learning by doing with collaborative projects. Now, a lot of us have experience of very shoddy, very poorly run projects that have really <laughs> been a joke, quite honestly. That's not what we're talking about. The same way that you do projects at work, the projects you do at work are really well designed. Well, at least you hope they are. <laughs> you are trying really hard to design these projects so that you learn, that you're collaborating, so that the students rotate through the various assignments, that, they're really, that, that there's really deep learning going on, and not simply goofing off because it's a cool project. No, well-targeted, well-run projects. That's what it's about. So what can you do? You can love. You can model. And very importantly, you can guide. What you've heard today I wish, actually, your kids, the kids you care about, our students, could have heard it. Because every time I have presentations in front of students, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. What took so long? They get it. But what they don't know 
is what it takes to get there. And this is where they need your wisdom, your guidance, your enlightened wisdom, your enlightened guidance. They need it. They need it more than any, at any other time because the world has become so much more complex. We cannot count on a 10-year-old to figure out what's needed. They see the tension. Help them explain it. Help them find their passion and get involved. This organization all here is very unique in the world and I really recommend you get involved. Go straight to their website and start helping. You all have your part to do wherever you are. Yes, it seems complicated, it seems impossible, and then all of a sudden it unlocks. But it's only going to unlock if all of us work on it. It's not going to happen by magic. It's going to take hard work. And really, I have a lot of faith in Australia. Australia is a country of pioneers. Pioneers have a different spirit. They try harder. They dare take risks. And I really think that you will. <laughs> Find your right place in the world. So, yes, it's going to require bravery. It doesn't come easy. This kind of change, this massive change, is not going to come easy. But with people like you, who are interested enough to spend a Thursday evening in a dark amphitheater, listening to me with a strange accent, really, you have to be commended. And this, we're all doing this for a better world. It's satisfying for us. It's satisfying for the planet. It's satisfying for the future of humanity itself. Thank you very much. Thank you.